Gabriel, thanks for, for uh, coming out and um, having the chance to uh, learn about history. Um, this is a, an event hosted by the uh, Hawaii Community College History Club. And my name is Mark Umbrello. I'm a history professor here. And I'm just really happy to see everybody. And super happy to see my good friend, uh, Lawrence, who came all the way from the uh, uh, Kingdom of Tonga. Uh, he's here doing some research and, work and workshops on uh, Pacific history. And it was just a really nice opportunity to invite him over and uh, have this talk tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about, or Lawrence is going to be talking about um, King Kalakaua and his efforts to create a uh, oceanic confederation. It should be super interesting and um, I'm sure you're all excited to uh, listen to what he has to say. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, give a warm welcome to my good friend and super great scholar, uh, Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence Garcia. Pan-Pacific policy, and then um, 
the next part will be the uh, contribution of Kalakawa during his early part of his reign, which is really the, the one part that's really the most underappreciated by like even those of his biographers that have focused on the Pan Pacific policy. This is like the very early part of his reign, is really when um, there's some quite amazing things happened that is, um, again, you know, not something that is, that is not really that appreciated. And then, of course, the number four is kind of the maybe most well known part, the uh, Hawaiian Renaissance, and alongside is what uh, uh, the, actually the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time referred to as the new departure in Hawaiian politics. So, this is the main thing in the 80s, that's really when all of this reached its climax. And then finally, um, uh, which then went into the phase five, and we're actually starting to implement that policy on the ground by setting up, sending a Hawaiian diplomatic embassy and a Hawaiian Navy ship to Samoa. And then finally, I will just, in a kind of an epilogue, uh, just reflect a little bit on the legacy of this, how this uh, can play a role today in today's uh, uh, Pacific, um, you know, Pan Pacific regionalism. Um, some of which is the way it's being discussed today, especially in the South Pacific in places that I've been recent, that I've lived recently, on some of the, and um, yeah, so just going to talk a little bit about that at the end of it. Okay, now let's start with uh, Hawaii's position in the Pacific. So, I just want to share uh, these two maps that I have uh, seen in, uh, throughout my research. The first one is, shows kind of the 19th century Hawaiian view of the Pacific. So this is the um, an, a map from the first school atlas that was published by the Hainaluna, the Hainaluna School Press in um, 1840. And um, as you can see, it has the entire Pacific Islands region labeled, everything labeled in Hawaiian. And very interesting is the, the, um, the title that is given to this map, it's called Aina Moana. So the, um, the idea of what, I guess, in English would be referred to as Oceania, the first and the original Hawaiian version of that is Aina Moana, the lands of the ocean. So that's kind of the, the uh, Earliest um, documented uh, Hawaiian term, at least in the in the kind of post-conflict time, in kind of the written Hawaiian sources uh, to refer to Oceania as Aina Moana. And very interesting also that Hawaii, from the very beginning, it was clear that Hawaii is part of the Aina Moana because the way this atlas was structured, you always had it, it, there's a map of the continent, and then there is detailed maps of each of the main countries in each continent. So you have, for example, the section of North America, you have a map of North America, and then you have a map of the US, then you have a map of Mexico, and so on, right? A map of Europe, and then you have a map of the UK, or France, or whatever. And the first part of the atlas has, this map is the first map, and then it has this map of the Hawaiian Islands. So it's very clear that um, the Hawaiian Kingdom is kind of conceptually saw itself as part of part of Aina Moana, or Oceania, as we would say in, in, in English. So that's kind of very interesting, uh, uh, definitely interesting to look at from this perspective. Now, I want to juxtapose that with a, a map that was published just 50 years later, I mean, nine, sorry, 80 years later in Germany, actually one of the German-speaking states, Germany was unified as a country. Um, so, not going to go into too much details of the, of the German language on it, but it is a map of it shows Polynesia and its political divisions. And you have these color codes here. You can see that. Um, okay, that would be nice to have. A, oh, okay, the cursor. The cursor works. Um, so you um, have an idea. It says English, the British possessions, where Australia, India. It says uh, Spanish, the Philippines, the Dutch, in Indonesia, the French, in Tahiti, and the New Caledonia. And then so it has the possessions here too. English possessions. Uh, French possessions, uh, Russian possessions, Dutch possessions, all of that. But then, after these seven um, voices in imperial powers, it has, um, it has a seventh category here, and that is what they label the Reich Kamehamehas. Now, Reich in German means of, of something like empire or realm. So, you have kind of essentially the, the empire of the Kamehamehas, as from this point of view of the German cartographer to the empire of Kamehameha, that's one of the seven powers of the Pacific. So that's kind of, I think, a very interesting um, view too um, from that time, um, 1850s. So totally contradicts this idea that Hawaii is kind of small and insignificant and islands that are like, kind of lost in the sea somewhere. 
or whatever noise, Hawaii is one of the seven regional powers in, 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 in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, now from, from this we can um, move on to the uh, next part here. I um, just wanted to share a little bit about the kind of leading up to King Kalakaua's period, the uh, work of King Kalakaua's predecessor. So essentially what we, what we have here is that this idea of uh, Pan-Pacific unity is uh, pretty much originates really, at least as a kind of government policy, uh, uh, originates in the 1850s. Now, of course, Hawaii has always had, you know, way back when, and uh, always been conscious of being part of the larger larger Pacific Ocean, and, you know, I mean, you have all references to Kahiki and, and other places in the, in the Pacific uh, for, for, for generations, but in terms of kind of modern Hawaiian Kingdom government policy, the, uh, this really originated in the 1850s, which uh, particularly this is one character, a uh, um, Hawaiian diplomat, uh, Charles St. Julian, who was uh, based in Sydney. He, his position actually was the Hawaiian, his Hawaiian measures is commissioner to the independent states and tribes of Polynesia. And he really, um, you know, uh, really conceptualized this idea that, uh, you know, Hawaii is just part of, I mean, Hawaii is the most important state in the Pacific Islands and it should, it is kind of pretty much, it's Kuleana. It's, it's, I mean, it's not just a, a not in the sense of, of really of, a, of an imperial project, but rather in the sense of Kuleana. So I um, mean, he essentially formulated as Hawaii's Kuleana to uh, help all these other islands, uh, help kind of nation building in these other islands. And then if all these island states kind of combine, then we have this kind of tremendous, what he called a power in the world. Like it's going to be something that's kind of unstoppable and it's not going to be taken over by, by these uh, encroaching um, Westerners. Um, and so that was during the time of coming in the third and the fourth in the 1850s, who were both pretty supportive of this project, at least in theory. And then it continued. Um, St. Julian then went to Fiji. He actually became the um, first Hawaiian ambassador to Fiji specifically, and then he actually supported the Fiji government and they hired him as a chief justice in Fiji. So he then kind of switched allegiance, but when, when he was still very working for. Pacific Unity, but he was started working no longer for Hawaii, but for Fiji. Um, but then in the, 18, um, in the 1870s, under King uh, Kamehameha V, there was another kind of uh, strong, more strong efforts towards that, when um, especially in these two uh, Hawaiian advisors that Kamehameha V had, uh, first the Frenchman, Charles de Valigny, and then the um, American, uh, uh, Charles Harris. So these two people were really the ones who um, come in the third to work with, and they also played an important role in advising him. And they were kind of all three of them were very strong advocates of um, Hawaiian, uh, you know, Hawaiian taking up a leading role in, in, in Oceania. Now, um, before we get to Kalakaua's way, let me just like, look at this. Let's look at the man himself too, and how maybe some of his previous experience. Because remember, King Kalakaua was not proved to be king, he was a, of the a, of a other lineage that was not supposed to be taking the, 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 the royal title, because it's only because the Kamehameha was the king, and Malino also died without an heir, so it was a series of, of elections. So Kalakaua, in a way, was more trained to become a um, you know, political leader, journalist, um, intellectual, public intellectual, all these kinds of things, then actually becoming king. It was more like uh, something that, that happened later. But um, I just want to highlight a few things that he, that he worked on. One thing is that he was one of the co-editors of the newspaper, Kahoko Kapaki Pika, which was a very interesting newspaper because it was the first newspaper in Hawaiian language that was not in some way or another affiliated with the American missionaries. Um, so there was the first paper that was needed, that fully dedicated to like Hawaiian things. I mean, they were they were producing they were uh, producing a lot of genealogies in their chants, different Mela Holy um, kind of power being published. Like a lot of um, this, yeah, more or less were being rewritten and, and republished. So it's really at the in a way a start of this kind of Hawaiian culture Renaissance, even though it really started then under King Kalakaua himself, it really became King himself. But it was like a Almost kind of a precursor, as you said, when they when they published that newspaper in the 1860s. And I also want to draw the attention to the title. I mean, he, he didn't call it Kahoku or Hawaii or something that's just Hawaii. It was like this focus on the Pacific, Kahoku Kapaki Pika. 
that was done on the Pacific. So there you see that Caracas, he was already as a, as a journalist who was not yet in the government. He was very interested in this kind of pan Pacific perspective. And um, well, then he also gathered some previous government experience as a privy councillor, uh, coming out of fifth, and also postmaster general. Um, because again, it had a lot to do with obviously with foreign relations. Yeah, I mean postal services. Um, so um, yeah, even before he became king, he was definitely uh, had a big interest in both foreign policy um, and kind of a pan Pacific view, and of course a strong view of Hawaiian cultural identity and, and cultural related. Okay, well now we have um, again leading to his role a very kind of a regrettable interlude, and um, I know there are some people who, who like King Manalilo and King Manalilo was definitely popular because the, the legislature voted for him, but uh, I mean, in terms of foreign policy, his short one year of rule was pretty much a disaster because he appointed the wrong people into offices, uh, he appointed Charles Reed Bishop into the foreign ministry, and Charles Reed Bishop was pretty much I mean, he became worse later, but even at that time already, he was pretty much a traitor to the kingdom. He was very much involved in, uh, you know, business uh, business interests and, and getting uh, Hawaii closer to the U.S. and not really interested in any real sustainable independence for the kingdom. And so, while uh, during that time, he tried, to, the bishop tried to close down the entire policy. So all these different um, all these different Hawaiian consulates were being closed down, and then. Um, well, St. Julian had gone to Fiji, but there was a, this office in Sydney, the Hawaiian Royal Hawaiian Commission to the Independent States and Tribes of Polynesia was being maintained. And this guy, um, Edward Reef, was um, St. Julian's designated successor. And this bishop sent him this very unceremonial letter and he voted him to just be simply Hawaiian consul in Sydney, like none of this Hawaiian Royal Hawaiian envoy to the Independent States and Tribes of Polynesia anymore. So um, there was definitely like some kind of really, uh, um, really bad kind of, kind of, you know, influence that coming from the little trying to shut this whole thing down that had been built up under kind of the third, the fourth, and the fifth. But um, as we also know that the, the rule of Lunalilo lasted only for uh, less than a year, and then after he passed away, and then uh, a new king came to power and. Also, Bishop lost his position in foreign affairs again, so I mean, obviously, it became better again. But, um, so there was some kind of serious setback for this during this one year of Ronaldo's rule. Um, but then, of course, we have the new king, Kalakawa, in February 12, um, 1872, uh, 1874, sorry. And now it becomes really interesting because. The, the usual discourse that I've heard in like, books like Dawes and others is that Kalakawa, well, he was kind of, maybe he became kind of a, a, a more, more pro Hawaiian later, but early in his rule, he was supposed to be kind of, you know, very interested in just in business with America. And that's why he went to America and negotiated his uh, treaty of reciprocity. So usually, uh, I mean, there's a lot of Hawaiian history books that uh, essentially portray his his travel to the U.S. to negotiate the, the commercial treaty as being kind of his first major act in his during his rule, and that I can tell you is totally wrong. That was not his first act. That was not his major concern one of that after after he got elected. The first thing he thought about after he got elected was to reconnect with Oceania. So, um, merely four days after his oath of office. That's like his first act of foreign policy. He wrote a letter to King Rakomba of Fiji that previously um, they had been this close connection initiated with the Kamehameha V. And um, so he wrote this letter to this is an August, the autograph letter that I found in the uh, Fiji National Archives. Um, and then one talks about King, you know, when I look at cast away, there's a new king, all the formalities, but also there it was accompanied by uh, instructions to the Hawaiian consul there to really be proactive and really totally renew this close relationship between Hawaii and the uh, Kingdom of Fiji. And um, the Hawaiian consul was um, then was also instructed to um, do anything he could do to help this Fijian government that was at that time kind of under siege already by the British who wanted to take Fiji over. 
And so he, the Hawaiian consul did what he could to try to get, there's another letter that is in the archives there where he writes to the Fiji and Kenya and says, you know, anytime, anything we can, anything Hawaii can do, we will help you, we're ready to help you in this crucial situation in your country. But unfortunately it was too late because uh, at that time, that in the the British were already in, all over, there were several British warships and they were like, you know, they were talking to all these different chiefs and these different provincial governors and they were like, bribing them and telling them, kind of trying to get them to fight against each other. And you know, the, the typical divide and rule kind of tactics, which then led to the uh, Fijian government officials having pretty much seen no other choice than signing a treaty of, of session to, to Great Britain, which they did in, the, in October of 1874. So again, this is one of these devastating impacts of this, of this one year of, of very inefficient and actually counterproductive Luna Vigo rule. When um, you know, if during that time they had maintained this, then probably Hawaii could have saved Fiji's independence, and Fiji would not have become colonized by the by the British. But I mean, this is just I think very, very telling. You know, where Kalakaua's heart really was, it was it, it was with his brothers and sisters in, in, in the Pacific, and you know, this, the fact that he did this four years, four days after the oath of office is, I think, really telling. Um, now the second part here, um, we will go to another archipelago to Samoa. So just briefly uh, uh, look into what happened in Samoa in 1873. So we had in Samoa in 1873, Samoa for the first time tried to create a centralized constitutional system. Um, what you need to know is that Samoa is, doesn't have a traditionally as centralized system as Hawaii had. So they were like lots of autonomous chiefs with different kind of chiefly titles and it was all very, it wasn't kind of a, a, a state-like society but more like a very decentralized kind of village council-based society. But with this Western influence, people in some form realized that they would need to build kind of a modern state, kind of a constitutional monarchy similar to Hawaii as, as well. And that's what they did in 1973. And um, now during this situation they were advised by um, this uh, American diplomat Albert Steinberger, and he was really helpful. He, uh, he shared a lot of kind of knowledge of you know Western statecraft with them, and, uh, and they, they really trusted him. And then he also said he would help them on, on their behalf and intercede with the United States and help them that, that the U.S. would recognize its independence of government. Um, anyway, um, later they would actually trust, trust him so much that they would actually appoint him uh, the premier. Prime Minister of Samoa. So this is, this is all, all that happened in 73, 74. But now this, here's where Kalakaua comes in. So um, in the later part of 74, so kind of, you know, even still like within the first year of his reign, um, he um, did three days start to take active interest in Samoa and also agrees to uh, recognize the Samoan government. And now, now here comes the interesting aspect of, of Mr. Steinberger. Steinberger traveled several times from Samoa to the U.S. to negotiate on, on Samoa's behalf with the government in Washington. And each time he stopped over in Hawaii. And so during those sort of trips, he confers with King Kalakaua, and there is a lot of a lot of discussions that these two have. And, and Steinberger is, I mean, he's not the same kind of arrogant American as many of them were at the time. So. He's actually quite, he's, he, he understands that as an American he has some knowledge of international law and of Western constitutionalism, but he doesn't really know how to run a Polynesian kingdom. I mean, that's not his, that's not his, his expertise, right? So he, he talks to King Kalakaua and he wants to know everything about Hawaii from King Kalakaua so that he could go to Samoa and be like the intermediate and kind of, you know, uh, essentially be like the liaison and bring all this knowledge of Hawaiian constitutionalism, including copies of, of the Hawaiian constitution to Samoa. And that is exactly, that's exactly what he does. And then, um, Kalakawa does keep up his promise. He formally recognizes the Samoan government. This is the paper that uh, is in the state archives, that, where it says uh, to the, to the Taimua of Samoa. Taimua is the, 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 the leading group of chiefs, so like the seven main uh, main, main uh, type of chiefs, and he pretty much tells them that yeah, he recognizes their government and he wants to, like, you know, lend his full support to someone coming in a modern, prosperous state, just like just like Hawaii is. Um, then they also start negotiating a, um, 
treaty of friendship between Hawaii and Samoa. And this is interesting because I, I the, 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 the copy is missing in the state archives and I've never seen it before. And like finally, earlier this year, I was finally able to re go to Samoa to the archives there and was able to get actually the only excellent copy of this draft treaty, which is, um, you know, it's very beautiful design. Most of it is written in pencil. Yeah, um, so um, yeah, there was a negotiating treaty between Hawaii and Samoa. Um, and uh, without any doubt, would have signed it pretty soon in 75 or 76. But again, there was some problem here. You had um, another kind of Western European imperialist interference here by the British. They, um, in 1776, they came into the warship and they, the British consul in Samoa conspired with the American consul because the American consul hated Steinberger because he, because the American consul was a crook like most of them, but Steinberger was an honest American, so obviously they, they clashed. And so, um, the, the, so the, the American consul who hated Steinberger actually conspired with the British consul and then they got this gorgeous American warship in to uh, take Steinberger out and deport him, take him to Fiji as a prisoner. And then of, then of course the American consul in Fiji was angry at the British and then they released him and sent him back to America. But, but so Steinberger personally didn't suffer from this, but the whole Samoan government that he had helped build it, that suffered from it. And then, um, so pretty much because of this, and then also the British and the Americans then, then supporting several rivaling uh, sites in Samoa after this, and then pretty much everything fell apart. And, that the that, 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 that Taiwan with Kamakawa and Steinberg was held and started to build it, it all fell apart again because of this imperial interference. So that's why the treaty was never further negotiated and never ratified. So that's why it's you know, just the only thing we have on this is the draft in the, in the Samoan archives. Um, nonetheless, there was some, I mean, there was some positive, more durable um, 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 outcomes of this kind of early Kalakawa's reign time, actually somewhat blending into even coming out of the last couple of years, is that we have um, we have these uh, we have three constitutions in the Pacific Islands in that during that period, 1870s, and they are all modeled on those of Hawaii. We have that one 71, 73 in Fiji that was under under 70 coming out of the fifth, and St. Julian's influence. Then we had the one I was just talking about, the Samoan one that the century Stanford wrote. Uh, well, the Kalakaua tell, essentially Kalakaua told Steinberg how to write it, and then, and then Steinberg negotiated with the Taiwan Samoan, and he negotiated and he made it into a workable constitution, as long as the, before the British came in and destroyed everything. And then we also have in 75 the constitution of Tonga, and that one is also based on the Hawaii. And this is for well, Hawaii is the country that I, that I currently live in, and um, that still operates under the, this constitution. So we have essentially a document that is, I would say, maybe 80% identical to the 1864 constitution of the Hawaiian Kingdom that is today still the rule of the law of the land in the Kingdom of Tonga. So, I mean, there's one kind of really um, tangible, um, lasting uh, uh, legacy of this kind of early Kingdom of period. And then um, there's also some more uh, detailed interaction with Tonga at the time, uh, because it's 1880, so this is now like a few years down the, down the road from that, but still in the, what I consider the early, early phase of Kalakawa's reign. Um, the King Tupo the I of Tonga uh, instructs his, his foreign minister, um, Shirley Baker, to um, write this letter, which I found in the state archives here in, in, uh, in Honolulu. And he writes to the Hawaiian government and says that Tonga wants to have a treaty with another, just like someone did in Standard. They want a French treaty with Tonga with, with, with Hawaii. And they say, well, they already negotiated one with the British and one with the Germans. And um, I mean, to them, the third most important country that they need relations with is Hawaii. So again, it shows you like how, how important Hawaii was for, uh, from that point of view of, of, of the German government. And how Kalakaua responds, and well, because it's actually not Kalakaua himself, it's the foreign minister who responds, because that's the formality, right? You have the, you have the, if the foreign minister of one country writes, then you have to have the other foreign minister 
get a key for those of us, right? But essentially, the Hawaiian foreign minister says, well, His Majesty has instructed me to, so essentially, it is, it is kind of talking to him, saying that it would, it would be his pleasure to sign a treaty with Tonga and, um, uh, you know, negotiate that. And unfortunately, in the end, we have, um, we have uh, a few that it was two or three times back and forth, and then the corresponding stops, because at that time, Tonga had, I mean, it wasn't as stable as Samoa was, or as Fiji was, but it still had, didn't have the same level of political stability that the Hawaiian Kingdom had. There were several like, chiefs that were rivaling, and they were trying to break away, and there were, like, there were like, all these different Christian denominations were fighting each other, there were different groups of missionaries were fighting each other. So there was a lot of trouble within Tonga, and for that reason, I think they just didn't, didn't follow up and didn't really uh, didn't do their part in negotiating this treaty. And then there were several times they keep coming more like requests from Tonga coming in and from Hawaii coming in. Says, what's 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 up? Where's your where's the follow up? We want to negotiate this treaty. You said you wanted it, but so yeah, it's kind of again an unfortunate uh, turn of events uh, that prevented that from happening. Um, now, at the same time, uh, Hawaii is certainly uh, beefing up its, um, its diplomatic um, representations in the Pacific. So throughout that period, like, which is again pretty much spending the time from, from Kamehameha the fifth rule all the way to the early time of, of King Kamehameha, we get all these different uh, Hawaiian embassies and consulates in the Pacific. These are just samples of, of letters in the uh, Hawaii State Archives where I copy the, uh, the, the, like the seal or the, the stamp. So we have here Kanikela Hawaii Ma Sydney in Australia, that's the first one, and we have Kanikela Hawaii Ma Tasmania. The next one is Kimberley Arena, but it says Hawaii Consulate in Newcastle, which is another Australian city. Then the one upper right is Kanikela Hawaii Ma Auckland in, in New Zealand, Aotearoa. Um, this one is very interesting. It's in the lower left. It's actually uh, it's the actual stem, like the, the negative stem that they made that embassy with. Um, that is in the National Museum of Fiji. It's called, as it says, Kanikela Hawaii Ma Fiji. That's the Hawaiian Consulate in Fiji. The yellow one is the Hawaiian Consulate in Samoa. And then the, the next one is actually dated in French, Consulat du Royaume de Hawaii. Uh, by that time, it's already a French protector, so that's why it's only in French. And then finally, which often gets forgotten, um, you know, we always talk about Melanesia and, and Polynesia, but we often forget Micronesia. And actually, Hawaii had a consulate in Micronesia too, with the Marshall Islands. It's, it's a Hawaiian commercial agency. I mean, commercial agency means it's a response that we know consulate. But don't let it be fooled by this term commercial, it's actually it's a government of government office. So it's kind of a, a, a kind of a lower ranking Hawaiian consular agency and uh, it's in Jalwick Marshall Islands. So um, Hawaii also had a diplomatic representation in the, in the Marshall Islands. So these are just a few there are some more but I didn't find the, the seals yet for them. Anyway just to give you again some idea of how how, how present Hawaii was throughout the entire Oceania during the time. Okay, now we take the next level. In 1881, King Kamakawa becomes the first head of state in world in the world's history to serve from the global. I mean, this is something that's really extraordinary because you know this is a time before jet planes, so it takes a while. And most heads of state at that time they were they couldn't do this. Either they didn't have the money, or even if they had the money, they would pretty much be, be sure that once they came back, they would be overthrown and somebody else would be king or president or, or, or whatever. So, I mean, because most countries were not that as stable as somebody was. But King Kalakawa did it. And um, now, what I want to focus on here is that during this trip, he really developed this global vision of kind of policy and coalition building. So, um, this is actually a map I made. I, I took you know, a long time to draw this up because it's the, that's the one that's going to be in, in my book, actually. And, um, you know, retracing this trip from, I mean, starting in Hawaii to the US, to Japan, China, Siam, Southeast Asia, all the way, British India, Egypt, um, and then to Europe, all the major countries of Europe, Germany, France, Britain, Spain, Portugal, Austria, Belgium. Um, 
and then over the Atlantic and back to the U.S. And several uh, steps in, in, in North America and on the, the Pacific Railroad back to San Francisco and back to Hawaii. So um, obviously he spent a lot of time in Europe, as you can see, and because these European countries were the ones that were, you know, they were the, they were the most powerful countries. They were the ones who were they were the ones sending sending warships to the Pacific and creating all kinds of trouble in the Pacific. So it was a good idea to be French to them. And they, both the British and the French had some respect for the way they did recognize the way, but there was always this tension that these were like these were potential colonizers who were like wanting to take over the Pacific Islands and you had to be careful about how to deal with them. So um, while he was in Europe with uh, doing a lot of important diplomacy, it's very clear from his own writings that really where his heart was was when he was visiting the countries of Asia, because that's really what he these were the people that he kind of connected to because these were these were monarchs and, and heads of state that had kind of similar problems. One of the problems is they were not white, so they were kind of you know always subject to this kind of white supremacist thing. They had Europeans come in European ships and American ships come. I mean, doing like kind of diplomacy, threatening to I mean, Japan had just had these, 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 these American animal apparently kind of coming there with the ships and pretty much threatening to shoot. Uh, cannons, you know, into Yokohama if they wouldn't, you know, make us make a treaty, this unequal treaty with, with, with the US. I um, mean, so these countries were essentially having the same experience, the same problems, but they had one disadvantage: they were not recognized like Hawaii was as, 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 as an equal of the West, because Hawaii was the only one that had that status since 1843. So I mean, there was kind of, a, you know, he had a lot of kind of mutual uh, interests um, and also mutual gains with these other non-Western countries, and so that's why on this map that I made, I, I labeled all of them in, in, in gray, like all of them a little bit more gray than, than the other ones. These are the ones that Kalakaua had kind of um, either visited or if he didn't visit them, he considered these were potential allies that he could kind of form some kind of global, global uh, kind of non-Western. Uh, alliance or coalition that would kind of together fight this kind of white supremacist colonialism and kind of create kind of an, an alternative world order. Ultimately, that was kind of the idea, and, and, and not have this Western uh, white supremacist colonialism dominate the world. And so, we have China, Japan, Asia, Siam, um, also get countries in the Middle East, Persia, the Ottoman Empire, of which Egypt was a part, kind of semi-autonomous part. Even uh, Abyssinia or some Ethiopia. He didn't visit Ethiopia, but he had he conferred with the ambassador from Ethiopia or Abyssinia in Cairo and, and then Madagascar. He also didn't visit, but he wrote letters to the Queen of Madagascar to express his solidarity. So these were, I mean, it was really Kalako had this idea of kind of, you know, essentially, how should I say it? It's like essentially kind of like this global non-aligned movement as it, as it originated later after World War II with these newly independent countries. I mean, you, you know, Gandhi in India, and, um, um, I mean, they were the first prime minister of India, Sukarno of Indonesia, Nasser of Egypt, all these kind of non-aligned leaders in the, in the 1950s. It's kind of that very similar idea that Kamakawa had, you know, 140 years earlier. So, just wanted to, to share that. The, the picture that's there is the picture of um, King Kamakawa in Japan and some of the officials of the, the Meiji Empire. Um, just one other thing that I wanted to highlight on this trip is that he... So on this trip he did go to Oceania itself, I mean to the, to the Pacific Islands property. That's something that will come in, 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 I'll cover in a second. But the one, the one country that he visited where he kind of felt the closest cultural connections was the uh, Maharaja Dam of Johor, which is now part of Malaysia. And because the people of Malaysia are, that's uh, Malay is an Austrian language, so it's very, it's closely related to Hawaiian, no, not as closely as, let's say, Samoan or Tahitian or like the Polynesian languages, but nonetheless, it's still, it's still closely related. And um, so one of the things these two were doing, they were, they were talking in English, but both of them were educated in, in English schools and could speak English really well. But they were then starting to um, recount to each other words in their languages, and they, within like five minutes, they had identified more than a hundred words that were cognates between Malay and Hawaiian. Uh, words like mata for I or maka, and uh, lima is both the hand and the number five in both languages, and then like, I mean, a ton, ton of other 
other languages. Uh, I don't know a ton of other words. I mean, there's, there's more than a hundred that are like totally like recognizable programs. And so, um, yeah, that's the first quote, which was published in one of the um, newspapers in, in Honolulu at the time. Um, so that's the first quote. And the second one is that besides the language, it's just even like the, the, the features of the people. I think when he looked at him and he saw it, like, he just saw like another Hawaiian essentially in this guy. He, he said that like, you know, was, uh, the, the appearance is so striking that he just like all people. So I mean, this was definitely uh, an important, um, had an important impact on Kalakawa too, that he saw other people who kind of looked like him being, being also kind of, you know, rulers of small independent states trying to survive in this kind of onslaught of, of Western colonialism that was kind of growing uh, everywhere uh, around these, these, these kingdoms and uh, chiefdoms. Um, but so of course then, once he comes back from this trip, then that's really when it all takes off, taking it takes it to a whole next level. So he comes back from this trip, has, has had all these experiences. He, when he saw all of Europe, he saw both the good and the bad sides of European imperialism, and then and he saw all these all these non-Western countries in Asia and the Middle East, and how they were dealing with, with kind of Western globalization. And based on that, then he started really just kind of full-on uh, launched himself into this um, Hawaiian Renaissance. I mean, that's a picture of the Hula uh, performance for his coronation. That's you know, one, of, obviously one of the most famous aspects that we all know today with the Mary Monarch. Um, and uh, also the publication of the Kumuli, which is the original <laughs> cover. is kind of back quality, unfortunately, but the first page. So that's the, that's the original uh, print, printed publication of the Kumulipo that was commissioned by him. And then at the far right, you see the handbook of the Halenawa Society, Halenawa Society, which is also um, an organization he founded, kind of a, uh, essentially a, a kind of society that's partly based on, on, on Freemasonry, partly based on the uh, traditional Halenawa, which is a kind of entity to, to uh, maintain genealogies. Um, in the traditional Hawaiian uh, system of governance, and then also by uh, Western science. So it was kind of interesting that they were trying to explore all three of those things. They were trying to explore traditional culture and, and, and arts. They were trying to explore traditional like, Hawaiian spirituality, bring back a lot of those after, after, after a long time of, of Christianization, and also explore Western science and, and see how it might be compatible with uh, traditional um, Hawaiian uh, uh, traditions and, and, and spiritual practices. So it was quite a very, very interesting um, enterprise to all, all in itself. But now what I want to focus on here is that this, this cultural renaissance also influenced King Alakawa's um, style of doing politics, um, especially foreign policy. Um, definitely after this, after this period he became much more assertive in his foreign policy. And also some of his cultural concepts really became, began influencing his, um, his policy. So for example, he started to not rely only on Western international law anymore, but he used Hawaiian cultural concepts. Um, and I'll, I'll bring it, I'll, I'll mention it in a, in a slide, a few slides down now. The Hawaiian claim over the entire Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, for example, was no longer based in just the right of discovery that, that than previous monarchs did, but he actually used, used to keep the Kumulipo and the, the, the names of those islands being in the Kumulipo as, as a use that as an argument to claim internationally that these islands need to belong to Hawaii. So he, he, he really took that like, cultural concepts and kind of tried to kind of modify and modernize international law by putting indigenous uh, 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 cultural beliefs, kind of you know, basic, basic uh, uh, international legal claims on those. That was I mean, quite really fascinating. In a way, how, how this kind of strengthening of cultural identity influenced his, uh, his policy making as well. Um, before we move on, I also would like to um, uh, take a short uh, time to uh, look into and, and present and also honor uh, some of the uh, advisors and supporters because you, know, you can't you can run a country or implement a policy just because you're the leader. You have to. Any of this to be efficient relies on a team of loyal supporters, you know, of experts to implement these things. And so these are, again, the list is not, not exhaustive, so if you have one favorite, then essentially, how, uh, 
character and you have your friend in there, don't be offended because I just had to at one point, um, you know, just mention it to you that I was seen as maybe the most important, but I mean, it's obviously kind of, can, could include quite a few others, so I have kind of on one side those who the, 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 the OEV ones and then the Howard ones on the other side. Yeah. Um, so let's start with the, with the Kanaka side here. Um, John, Mac John Capena, he was uh, one of his actually friends who was also a co-editor with him of the Hukoka Pekipika. So they go back, those two go back really long time, they're really close friends and very, very similar uh, uh, political visions like in their, in their youth already. And then he was his first foreign minister, he was, uh, when he, when he did, did all of these early things with Samoa and Fiji and all of that, that was Makana, uh, uh, Makini Kapena, Makini Kapena was his, was his minister for this Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time. So he played a role. Um, then we have John Bush, who was uh, actually was governor of this island, he was governor of Hawaii for quite some time under his rule. And then he was Minister of Interior, and then he was actually the one who was to be sent to Samoa and other Pacific Islands. He became kind of the most important ambassador to implement uh, the Hawaiian, um, those, that Hawaiian project of, of panel changes later in Karakawa's research. So, so John Bush is definitely um, one, of the, one of the most important uh, uh, ones in that sense. Um, we also have um, Curtis Iokea, um, one of the major diplomats who, he was also the chairman for, for some time. The chairman is the one who runs the royal household and like, who runs the palace. Um, and he was sent on a follow-up trip kind of around the world, kind of the same sense that Kalakaua had done it, like one year later, or two years later, to just kind of follow up everywhere. And he especially, I mentioned here because he was also, he, he again met with uh, the, the Maharaja of Johor and some of these other leaders of Kalakaua really identified strongly with, so he played that really an important role. And um, then we have Henry Poor, um, who um, was, both the uh, assistant to Iokea on this trip around the world, and then also he was the second in command to John Bush in Samoa, so it's another one who played an important role as a diplomat. And then um, finally, there were these two half brothers, uh, Robert Hua Pili Baker and John Tamatua Baker. And um, like, they were also uh, very influential and very supportive at the time. Uh, Robert Hua Pili Baker several times wrote um, political pamphlets to kind of really urge the government to be even stronger and even more assertive in its role to, uh, to unify Oceania and to defy any of this kind of Western, Western uh, white supremacist imperialism. So he was, he was one of the kind of really strong, almost kind of heavy handed supporters in a way. Like he was almost like kind of, kind of urging the king to go like, even more into this kind of very radical kind of you know, pro-active, pro-native kind of Pacific policy. And, um, and then his half-brother, John Tomato Baker, he was actually the last governor of, uh, of Hawaii Island. He, he lived in, in, he was based in Hilo. You might know him because he is the one who posed for the Kamehameha statue. They, he, he put on Kamehameha's Aungula and let himself be, be photographed and then it was used as the, as the model for the, when, they, when the, that French artist did the, did the statue in, in, in and before it was shipped to, to Hawaii. Um, so he's famous for that, but he's also famous as a politician because he was also very, a very strong supporter of the Pan-Pacific orientation. He himself was like one quarter Tahitian, which of course he obviously held in that kind of identity. But um, he also is the one who then traveled throughout the Pacific in 1907, so after the overthrow when everything seemed to be lost, but he in a, in a way continued uh, Hawaiian diplomacy kind of underground in a way and traveled throughout all these different Pacific Islands and um, had maintained, you know, kind of in a way para-diplomatic or like underground diplomatic relationships with uh, pretty much all the, all the leaders, the Kingdom of Tonga, the Samoan chiefs, the Fijian uh, chiefs, uh, the, the Maori out there. Or, so he was definitely a very important Hawaiian kind of pan-ocean or pan-Pacific, pan Polynesian pan uh, figure as well. Now on the other hand, you see among the uh, Howard advisors, we have uh, again Charles Harris, who was kind of the leftover, I guess, from coming out of the fifth. He was coming out of the fifth uh, foreign minister and very active in especially establishing his connections with the Fiji. He 
He worked a lot with Common Meredith to do that. And then he was also a personal friend and mentor of King Kalakau. He's actually the one who he was trained as a lawyer in the US before he came to Hawaii. He's the one who trained King Kalakau in law, like he was the one, he was the mentor who trained him in kind of legal legal knowledge, I mean Western legal knowledge. And um, he was then uh, chief justice for a while and you know so like in this early transition period when Kalakau took over Harris was, was really important to kind of you know get get you know trends for this transition from from the kind of coming out of the fifth row to to Kalakau, to Kalakau. and then um, the second one we don't have a picture that's why I just put this anonymous uh, anonymous out 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 there um, John Sheldon I mean sorry Henry Henry Sheldon and he's quite interesting he's uh, he's uh, also from America naturalized to become a Hawaiian national. And uh, he was a journalist, and he was the, um, one of the earlier editors of the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, and he's, uh, he's essentially the one who took the, uh, bought the Pacific Commercial Advertiser from the missionary family from, from, from Whitby, and he turned it into a pro-government paper. And he let go that he really did the targets in the late, in the mid, mid 1870s, really urging about it, Hawaii needs to do this is like always Koreana to go out. Uh, United Pacific Islands, and I mean, he was like really very, very strong, had a very strong opinion towards that. And, and his um, his half Hawaiian son, uh, John, John Shan, I forgot, but anyway, like his half, his, his, his son who was, was part Kanaka, uh, he then became uh, one of those leaders of the Hui Aloha Island back in the 90s against sanitation, against, against the overthrow. And, if anybody is familiar with the biography of Joseph Navajo, it was probably in 1905 or 1906 or whatever, I forgot. That's, that's, that's John Sheldon, that's, that's the son of, of this guy. So both father and son, Sheldon, you see, that's, that's an important family to, to support uh, kind of very loyal kind of uh, writers for, for the kingdom and especially for this kind of specific policy. Um, then we have William Green, who it's kind of, let's say, he's like one of these complicated personalities because I, I could just kind of love him as much as I hate him in this context here because he was a foreign minister in the, um, well, after, after Capena, uh, he was a foreign minister for a while, uh, late, late 70s, I think. Um, so he was a foreign minister, he was really, I mean, he was instrumental in some of these correspondences during that time, uh, the 70s and the 80s. For Kalakawa, and he was, you know, he was very well independent, wrote what Kalakawa asked him to do. But then, unfortunately, after '87, he was part of the, he was part of the bayonet game. So he, he kind of sided with first and all these people, and then he, uh, they made him foreign minister again for a while under the under the bayonet regime. So he, and again, he kind of, and all the good things he did earlier, he kind of undid later in his life. So I, that's why I put it initially here. So initially he was, he was a supporter, but then unfortunately. Became his loyal um, Then we have Paul Gibson. He's probably the most important and most, uh, uh, well, the longest serving kind of loyal, not only the person during the whole period, because he was really, um, he, 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 he was fluent in Hawaiian, he owned several newspapers, and he was, I mean, one of those who moved like from, even before Pikalakawa was in power, he was like, you know, constantly talking about how uh, this, like, Oceania needs to be united, and um, Hawaii should be like uh, Hexakolian towards its, its brother nations in the south. And um, he also was very much into this kind of whole pan Australian language group because he, he previously was in Indonesia and I mean, in the Dutch East Indies, and he actually was was part of the anti-colonial resistance. He was uh, he had one of these native rulers in Sumatra to fight against the Dutch. And the Dutch put him in jail for that and almost executed him. So he's like, I mean, he previously had experience in helping anti colonial movements, and then he came to Hawaii and, and became Kalakawa's first his advisor and then his foreign minister for actually most of his Renaissance period, mid 1880s. And then we have uh, an other interesting character, Giorgio uh, Cesare Moreno. He was, uh, he was Italian. And he had a very similar background to Gibson. He also was pretty much involved in almost any, any anti-colonial movement he could think of before coming to Hawaii. He fought along the British, the British, uh, he fought along the Indian 
uh, and rebellion against the British against British rule in 1857. He was one of the few uh, Westerners to fight with the Indian rebels against the British in, in British India. And then he was also part of another Sultanate in, in Sumatra fighting against the Dutch uh, in, in Indonesia. And yeah, and then he came to Hawaii with kind of a very similar attitude in Kamakawa, and he made it Prime Minister of Japan, yeah, Minister of Foreign Affairs for, for a short period too. Um, and then finally, Joseph Webb, another interesting character. He was a British settler in New Zealand, in the South Island. Like just a very boring kind of person, but very interesting. And in, in any, I mean, who would have thought? But then somehow, in 1880, he moved to Hawaii with, with his wife. And then within like within like a week of their arrival, you can read the newspapers how him and his wife were at one of the balls at the palace, and then he became. Uh, you know, and very, very quickly rose in the ranks of Kalakaua supporters, and, and, and uh, I mean, he had some, he had some expertise because he was a, he had, ex and he had expertise in journalism in New Zealand, and also in local government. He was in the, I think, city council of of the New, in, in New Zealand. So again, he's, some, he's you know, somebody with skills, with aggressive skills, but very, very loyalist personality. And those are the kind of people that Kalakaua obviously wanted to have in his entourage. He, uh, so Webb was uh, secretary of the foreign ministry uh, during most of the 1880s. So another another one of those. And then actually after the after they left, they put him in jail. The frame and the Thurston frame the so-called corruption put him in jail. And then there were petitions circulating for his release. Like people like, like, like hundreds of Hawaiian subjects uh, signed petitions to get him released. So that also tells you how much of the uh, of the law. Um, like the servant of the kingdom it was. Um, also, so two more supporters I want to highlight here, but they were not actively in politics, they were in art, but I mean, I think art is just as important as, as, as you know, I mean, for, for if you do like nation building and, and those kind of things, um, you shouldn't underestimate the arts. Um, you can't just nation build by just having people in offices, like bureaucrats running for a policy. You need, you need art as well. And two people who specifically came here very handy were was this, this uh, couple, um, uh, Isabel and Joe Strong, and both of them were, um, you know, also in Kalakawa's inner circle. And, um, Joe did a lot of landscape paintings, but also, I mean, he was commissioned by the king to do a lot of uh, kind of official, official uh, uh, portraits and stuff. And then um, he was also a photo photographer, and he was sent to someone to do like the, the, all these brilliant photographs that we had from this Hawaiian diplomatic embassy to someone. That's him and then his wife. She designed the royal art of the Star of Bahia, which I'm going to talk about uh, briefly uh, in, in, in a few minutes now. And um, this is one of the other, one of the menus that you're going to have. So she was just a bit of kind of graphic design, but I think her most important work is that, that royal art that, that she designed.
Christian missionaries who were uh, in several islands of Micronesia, especially in Kiribati. And these were also advising some of these native rulers and were translating these petitions into Hawaiian. So this is a very interesting thing because you have these, these petitions of these letters written in the Kiribati language, which are among the oldest written, written documents in that language at all. And then they were translated into Hawaiian so that the Hawaiian people could read them. So you have, uh, you have international diplomacy here without English, which is wonderful. I mean, you just like one native language of the Pacific to another. So it's quite an interesting thing here. And then Pinkalakawa writes them back. It's one of the one of the letters in the state archives where he writes back to um, one of them, I think it's to to yeah, to take care of Mutarikari. And so he calls this Pinkalakawa self-identifies here as Mo'i Okohawa by Ayana Amike Kai Mao Ayana Polynesia. So he calls Kalakawa already kind of Sees himself as the king of the Hawaiian Islands and of some islands, some other islands in Polynesia. So it's already kind of, uh, in a way, pre previewing kind of this this kind of nation coalition building uh, or, or, or expansion in, in in the Pacific. Why does he refuse? Why does he refuse that? Um, yeah, well, that's that's interesting. He refused it at that time because he. Um, he is just worried that, um, you know, because of, because of the, the gunboat diplomacy happening there, that, that Hawaii would get somehow embroiled with British or German um, ships and whatever, and that Hawaii would get kind of in trouble. So he says that uh, he kind of said, well, hold on, I can't do it right now. We have to kind of see and negotiate. And then first have to kind of see what's really going on. And he's just kind of somewhat hesitant, which is, I mean, in a way, understandable too. You don't want to, you want to kind of get launch yourself into an adventure, you don't really know what's going on, so he's, he's hesitant, but I mean, a few years later, he's actually less hesitant about it, but in his first, he, in his first uh, year, he is, he is somewhat hesitant now. We can see it as a weakness, or as, um, I mean, as, you know, not really get to interpret it too much, but I mean, it's, the fact is he, he, he was somewhat worried about getting involved in something he couldn't really control the outcome. But um, he invites them to attend the, 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 the coronation, which then they didn't come to. But then, because of that, he would actually send uh, another uh, Hawaiian diplomatic mission there. Um, there was also this other king, um, Pinoka of Abemama, who um, happened in the picture. And he is actually has a quite different ambition. He wants to become the, he says that he wants to become the Kamehameha of the Gilbert Islands and conquer all these other small chieftains, and he wants King Kalakawa's help. Now, they are also King Kalakawa, who writes it back in a very nice way, but he says, well, hold on, hold on, I can't, I mean, I got a good idea, but we got to go to talk more, and I know we got to send an ambassador to see what's going on, and, and so the, the, the communication is going, but again, it's, Kalakawa is still hesitant to, to go, go in there, like, all the way, so he, he sends this guy, um, Captain Tripp, who is a, uh, I, I could have put him into that list of supporters too. He's a Privy Council member and Chief Captain, and he sends him to, to, to Kiribati to follow up with, with all those different uh, island kings. But uh, unfortunately, he has another bad twist of, of fate here that the ship is, that ship is, is uh, runs around the reef, and so this uh, mission fails at that time. Um, now, in 1883, um, pretty much the effect that these communications, especially with the, with the Kiribati chiefs, have is that yeah, instead of actually like going right right into those and, and accepting all these requests, what 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 it precipitates is um, that uh, Kalakawa and Gibbs make this big make this statement and make a, a, a protest declaration and pretty much create a a kind of a, a, a new kind of political doctrine where Hawaii claims, like, presents to all these Western countries that the Pacific is off limits to them. Like, that this is really this is the Hawaiian sphere of influence. Um, and in all these nations, all these small Pacific islands, the native um, rulers should actually be fostered to create kind of modern stages like Hawaii. And instead of trying to colonize these islands by saying that all these are kind of weak and they don't know how to govern themselves, or all these excuses that all this made, um, they said, look, I mean, we in Hawaii, we have been recognized by you guys in 1843. 
we are now an independent kingdom, an independent state that has global recognition, so you respect us. Why don't you respect those other people too? Just leave them alone. Uh, let us help them to, to become developed kind of modern states that like Hawaii already is. And then you can and then you recognize them too, but don't mess with them. It's not, it's not your Korean to be in our part of the world. This is, this is like, this is the Pacific. This, is, this, is, this belongs to us and to our brother nations in these, in these, in these other islands. So that's essentially the, the message of this. And it's very interesting. They must have spent a lot of money on this because they did this with some kind of ink that's very, very, I mean, very, very durable. Also on some paper, it's very durable, because I went to, I, I saw this, the same, the same piece of paper in the German archives, the French archives, the Belgian archives, and the Netherlands archives. And it doesn't look like something from the 1880s. It looks like something that was written like two years ago. Like it's some kind of, it's, I think, parchment paper, and it is written with an ink that is like, I mean, that must be, must be really expensive ink because the, the paperwork before and after is all crumbling apart, you know, like the paper from that time is. But not this one. So they, they, uh, they made like, they just, they just look at this and feel it and hold it in your hands. It's just like a big carnival. It is like this, you know, this, 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 this you know, Hawaiian claim of like the Pacific should be the should Pacific for the Pacific Islanders. Um, and then see it in this kind of high quality paper, it's just that really was like, you know, some of these, some of these moments of excitement for like a researcher, like maybe if I see something like that. And so they sent this to um, 100, I don't know, to more than to 40 different countries. And uh, interestingly enough, none of them replied except for the, well, the British replied, and the British said, well, it's a good idea, but you should, you should really tone it down, you're being too arrogant. That was the British say. And then the Dutch, the Dutch, that's interesting, the Netherlands, they say, right on, this is a good idea. Uh, we should, this is actually a good idea, and we should, uh, we, we, we fully support this. And then the Dutch government, I mean, they were pretty bad colonizers in Indonesia, we know that, and they were, they were oppressors there, but at least towards Hawaii, the Dutch government was like, the, like, had the most positive attitude. They were actually several times trying to, to uh, invite Hawaii to international conferences during that time, too. Um, and it's always, it was always shut down by the Germans, the British, and the, and the, and the Americans. But the, the, the Netherlands, you know, I must, we must say, um, they were, so they were the ones who were, who were most uh, supportive of this um, among all the other Western countries. Um, now, before we um, go further into the foreign policy towards Oceania, Kalakaua noticed in the mid 80s that he said, he first said that there's still some things to clean up at home here in Kohawai Paimana. And that the territorial integrity of Kohawai Paimana is really complete. They kind of noticed it at the time. And um, so the Northwestern Hawaiian, the most remote part of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands had not been formally claimed by Hawaii. And because they were uninhabited, they were, it was kind of a contested thing under international law. So um, they, in 1986, uh, Kamakawa sent the, um, his Hawaiian Majesty's ship, Manu Kauai, with Captain Colonel um, James Boyd. And that ship was sent to really to complete the, the Hawaiian territorial claims over the entire Pine Island. And he went all the way to the last island in the chain, Moku Papa or, or Kure. And he planted the Hawaiian flag and claimed it as, uh, you know, made it clear to everybody that this is part of the, part of the Hawaiian kingdom. Now, and then, as I mentioned before, it was not just using the kind of Western narrative that if you get an unhandled island, you need to go there and plant a flag and then it's yours. But you also use, and the explicitly part of this claim was that this is an ancestral territory, that ancestral belongs to the because the Kumulipu mentions the entire island chain and, and, and other uh, genealogical chains as well. So um, that's kind of a very interesting thing. I, I think how this kind of this, this cultural consciousness that Kalakaua had was kind of uh, influenced this. And now then there was another problem. The problem is that the island of Midway, which is the one right before, the second to last one of the chain, that one was actually claimed by the US in 1867, because again, under this Western legal definition of sovereignty, if nobody is there, um, the first country that comes to advance the flag owns it, right? So the, the U.S. Had, had done that and they were, they were, at that time, they had no 
not planned, not built in any way, but it's anything. They had just went, they had just gone there and planted that flag. So later they would build the Lego bases, which you know in World War II was important and all of that. But at that time they just had this claim, but they had, it was on all maps. So it said that Midway and then US because they had claimed it. So Kalakawa obviously was very angry about this, and then he wrote so he wrote a letter to um, Secretary of well, no, I mean, his gifts at the foreign ministry. Foreign minister wrote a letter to the Secretary of State um, Bayard. So remember, this is the first administration of Cleveland. So this is when this is Cleveland's first administration. Cleveland and Cleveland, as you know, he was a friend of the Queen. He was not an imperialist, right? He was one of those few Americans who was like Bono, who was, who was acting properly in foreign affairs. And so, um, so, so, so when I call the administration, he writes to Bayard and says, look, um, I know you guys say this, I mean, and I know under you guys international law, you have the right to do it. But please understand that this island is important to us. This is part of our genealogy. We need all this, this, this entire island chain is really us, and you and, and, and we feel very deeply about this. So please, please make an exception and just give up this claim that you guys you guys made and give it to us. And surprisingly enough, the uh, Cleveland, Cleveland administration was very uh, sympathetic to that. They wrote back, okay, well, that's an interesting. We've never kind of had this kind of claim before, but it's, I mean, it kind of makes sense. And they, let's, let's negotiate and let's try to settle this. And so they were, so I can tell you, if the bad who hadn't happened, and you know, how I wouldn't have pursued that, you know, if, if how I had pursued it later, further, under a DC government and not an SBAM and usurpers, um, I'm sure that the U.S. administration would actually have given up. It was almost almost about to happen. They would have given up the claim of Midway, and then Hawaii would be like the entire pipeline would have been like under a kind of you know territorial integrity uh, of Hawaii. So that's kind of interesting too. So kind of cover for that. We need to do that first, and then you know first we we definitely make sure that the entire pipeline is ours, and then we go on to the next step to go further out in the in the Pacific. Um, I have a few more slides here. Um, so then we had, um, so after this was, this was initiated, then in Paracau again in late 1886 turned his attention back full on to the Central Pacific. So he created the Royal Order of the Star of Oceania in uh, December. Mm. And that was meant um, to, I mean, the, the statute say in, in recognition of services to advance the good name and influence of Hawaii in the islands of Polynesia and other groups of the surrounding ocean. Uh, one thing that I um, didn't really think about, and then I, I must uh, give some uh, credit to um, a friend of mine, my former roommate, Yahi Lee, because I, I, just, I discussed it with her years ago, and suddenly she came up with, wait a minute, I'll come with it, and I hope it will always stand here, right? It's the Hawaii. Wait a minute, Hope oh, 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 yeah, yeah. That sounds like something Kalakawa already did it before, right? Hope oh, 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 Pika, right? Hope oh, the star of it just if you change the Pakapika with, with Oceania, which essentially means the same thing. So um, I never really thought about it, but I think that when my friend mentioned that it kind of makes sense of it, Kalakawa is that he he he, he already he got, I think he got that name from the order from the from the newspaper that he, that he edited earlier. So I mean Anyway, the point I made was that it's again it's kind of it's a long-term kind of interest of color color that again you see here in the, the choice of words and all of that. Um, just the statues go over the group. I know it is kind of I think over time. So um, the yeah. this, I'm good. Okay. All right. So, um, the statutes uh, of the order we have, um, they're published in English and, and Hawaiian. And I just want to read that one section here because I think it's very interesting in terms of how Oceania is defined, which is, again, like a very broad definition. Um, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the, the Hawaiian first. Okaweha, Okaweha, Kea Hoanohana, Okahoku, O Oceania, Kikukuro Kiani. Kikukuru 
Amina Aina e Pili Kokoke Maya Ma. So in, in English, there would be, well, we cut the first party, but the, the one word of the Star of Kenya is hereby established for the recompense of distinguished services rendered to us or to our state, and in advance in the name and influence of Hawaii. And now it comes to the definition of Kenya. Amongst the native communities of the islands of the Pacific and the Indian Oceans and on contiguous continents. So he is thinking of Oceania as not just some of the islands south of Hawaii, but he is thinking really about um, the islands in, of course, all these islands, but also all of the Southeast Asia, all of Indonesia, uh, all of these people who are speaking Australian languages, uh, Philippines, Indonesia. Madagascar, um, some of the other islands in the, in the Indian Ocean, the Maldives, all of that. So it's really a, a very, it's very uh, a broad um, kind of vision of what he, of what Kalakaua considers to be included in Oceania. So again, it's not just, you know, it's always, Kalakaua is always trying to think big and not small. I think that's the, that's the point that, that I think we can, we can get from this. Okay, and now we come to this kind of, I guess, the last really important chapter here where we really start to put theory into practice. So, so far what we had was a lot of, you know, a lot of talk, right? A lot of, a lot of sharing interesting ideas, coming up with interesting ideas. Um, we had some communication, we got letters back and forth, we got the Pacific Islanders wanting something from Hawaii, we got Hawaii offering itself to other Pacific Islanders, we got all these kind of Changes of, of Manao essentially, but no real concrete action yet, right? But now in early '87, uh, we actually get to that action. So in, in, in um, early '87, Kalakaua sends the a Hawaiian um, diplomatic embassy and also the Hawaiian warship Kapilua, the only the only warship that the Hawaiian Navy has. They send that to down to Samoa, and pretty much with the very express purpose to defend the independence of Samoa against any kind of Western um, imperialistic interference. Um, now, of course, remember back what happened during early Kalakaua's reign, right? He was, he was being very instrumental in trying to get to Samoa and first Samoan constitution set in the first place. He negotiated with the uh, Samoan chiefs and with their main advisor, Sandburg. Um, and then it all fell apart because the British came in with their warships and messed everything up in Samoa. Right, so he really wants to, uh, this time he wants to make sure that that doesn't happen, so he sends actually a Hawaiian warship there um, to, um, yeah, to at least discourage other countries from, from, from doing this kind of gun-gun war diplomacy again, and to also give the Samoans actually some, um, or give them some confidence that Hawaii is actually doing something for them, you know, uh, not just sending letters, but actually sending this, sending this warship. And here's a picture of um, Queen Maria Tuala Pepa, that's the one in the center of the picture, this one. And he actually wears the uniform, that Hawaiian uniform that came from the Hawaiian center. You can see the cow leaves on the, well, you can't even see here, but on the, on the belt, it has like these kind of golden, um, golden cow, cow leaves, which is the top symbol of the you know, Hawaiian world for uniforms. And um, we have Bush and Kaur, these two Hawaiian diplomats that also wear these, these Hawaiian uniforms with the, with the um, also the embroidery of Kao um, on their uniforms. And so yeah, this is like one of these, this is like a moment really right now it is really that like it takes off. Now we actually have the uh, Samoans and the Hawaiians really like working together. And just like a few months of, well, not even if you mind, just like a few weeks of negotiations, they produce, um, produce this document, which is in the, in the state archives uh, here in Honolulu, and that is the, the Treaty of Confederation between Samoa and Hawaii. So, that one was signed by, by Mario Toa and Bush in, um, in February of 87. And um, then it was sent, well, it was ratified in Samoa right away. This is actually the ratification document. This has a Samoan seal of state on it and has Mario Toa's signature and has the signatures of all these uh, members of the Samoan government. The Taimua and Fakule, as they're called. And so on the Samoan side, it's ratified now, right? And then it gets sent back to Honolulu. And then they, um, the Hawaiian king ratified the King Halakaua 
science history to do it, and that's sometime in March. So what this treaty essentially says is that Karl and Maria Dorn pledges himself to uh, a political con confederation with King Kalakaua, and that he would essentially uh, let Kalakaua after consultation with him, but nonetheless uh, uh, let Karakao pretty much run Samoa's foreign policy because Samoa is just too big to have its own foreign policy. They, 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 and they can't afford to have, no, to have some more ambassadors in the rest of the world, at least not at that time, because it's all kind of tenuous and unstable. But Hawaii does that. Hawaii has, Hawaii has at this time, has 103 diplomatic embassies and consulates throughout the world. So the fact to know that Samoa pledges itself to be to this con to this confederation with Hawaii. Now all these Hawaiian ambassadors and diplomats, they are all now representing Samoa as well. So this is really a big advantage because now Samoa has like at least at least some kind of feeling of, of, of uh, its independence being protected. You know, it, it, it takes kind of part in this, I mean in the way Hawaii is, extends its, its umbrella of being a recognized independent state to, um, to someone. So that's kind of the idea behind this, behind this treaty. Um, now, of course, as well as in Samoa, we have a very, um, very um, decentralized system of, of government, which in a way is, is good on the ground because each village council pretty much runs itself and there's level of this kind of you know government bureaucracy that is remote from the people and whatever so they have you know they, they, they manage it pretty much themselves on the on the local level which is great in a way but it's also a disadvantage if you want to do international diplomacy right if you have this kind of very decentralized structure. But the Hawaiian um, the Hawaiian uh, embassy uh, the Hawaiian ambassador Bush and, and, and his assistants they are pretty much aware of this so they so they know that just the signature of Barreto on that paper is doesn't really count for anything unless we have all these different Samoan villages like subscribe to it. So what they're doing really now is they're going like to like and that's where the Samoan worship comes in because they just can go around some of the coast of Samoa and they land in pretty much every second village and you know tell the people about it, to talk to the village chief and try to like, get him to support this. And in most cases it works pretty well, like yes, an example here in, um, in Luffy Luffy village where the um, uh, Mata Afa Yosefo, one of the other high ranking chiefs, who is kind of almost as high rank as Maliator. So he's one of those that you really get, you really need to have him, him on board, because otherwise you, you pretty much don't have influence over someone if, if you get this kind of master. So, so again, you sit down with him, you drink coffee, and all that, all that, all that cultural protocol that's, that's appropriate, and then they get. Um, um, Mata Afa, this kind of very high ranking chief to support the thing as well. And then there's one other chief, um, Tufua, and um, yeah, Tufua Tamasesa. Um, and he is, they also negotiate with him, but he is unfortunately, he gets bribed by the Germans, and the Germans are really trying to set him up as, a, as an kind of opposing king. Um, and um, he kind of sees, like, so notes to the Hawaiian embassy and says, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to just let, I mean, I'm actually ready to negotiate with you guys and I, I don't really want this, but, you know, just, you know, be careful what you do because you got the Germans who are trying to set me up as a, as a, as a, as a puppet king. And so that's why I say that the Hawaiians never get to actually negotiate with him, but nonetheless they know that he's actually, personally, he's, he's, he's also in favor of this. So again, it looks like it's actually going overall pretty well, but you're already, the problem is already clear that there's a very strong German imperialist presence that is really, really hates this is annoying uh, influence there. Um, now, at the same time, this is supposed to go much further. So Bush is not just commissioned to go to Samoa, so the next thing you see, Bush carries his letter, which is a personal letter from King Kalakaua to King before the first of Tonga. So finally, I remember in 1881, there was this, this I mean, 80, 80, after 1881, there was this discussion with the Tonga wanted to have a treaty with, with Hawaii, and then they wrote messages back and forth, but then Tonga kind of stopped to, to continue uh, negotiating. Um, so now Kalakaro kind of catches up with uh, where they left off, and uh, he sent this letter to the first, and he 
Maybe this time he just doesn't just send it, but he, he, he tries to let it to, to push, and push is supposed to be after everything is here in some more, everything is, everybody is, is on board with that, with that hour in some more, really. Push is supposed to go to Tonga and actually deliver this letter to him. This is, of course, not the original, this is just a typewritten copy, because the original is lost, unfortunately. But, um, so he is supposed to hand that letter to King to the first, and first of all, have this French treaty, and then also, secondly, also invite Tonga to join this confederacy with Samoa and Hawaii, so we make it even stronger. I mean, we get three parties in this treaty, not just Hawaii and Samoa, but Tonga as well. So that's, that's the idea. And Bush instructions go even further because Bush is then supposed to go to the Cook Islands. I just have a picture of the most important ruler, this is the Queen Makea of Kalatonga. Uh, of um, so she would probably be the one he would have negotiated with, maybe. Um, so, um, so they are supposed to also invite the Cook Islands to join the Confederation. And then finally, and now comes the follow up with this, with this 83 thing with, the, with Kiribati. So now finally, Kalakaua and Gibson and all of his advisors, they have thought about it a long time and they say, yeah, we should, we should really go for this. So they he should, he should then go to Kiribati and just renegotiate with all these chiefs and whichever they want. If they want to annex to Hawaii, he should just annex them. If they want a Hawaiian protector, he should do that. If they want to join the Confederation as a member state, he should do that. So he's pretty much whatever they want, he should, he should implement that and, and have them extend whatever Hawaii can do to have these help them and, and what, what, what they would like to, to do. Um, and yeah, this is to follow up with this, uh, what, what uh, Captain Tripp was supposed to do in 83 when his, when his ship, before the ship uh, ran around the, the reef in, in Kiribati. Oh, did he die when the ship crashed? Uh, no, no, he didn't die. But right. he had to be rescued and put on another boat and come back to Honolulu. I think two or three weeks of his school members died, so it was pretty, the ship was totally ruined, so, but he didn't die personally. Um, so, so far it looks all great, but, but then we also have to face the unfortunate, you know, uh, uh, reality of what happened in history. And then, in 83, I mean, I mean, in late 87, unfortunately, this is all ended, and it was all ended by pretty much concerted effort of uh, people in Honolulu and in Berlin. Um, how, how far they really conspired with each other, I'm still not clear, but it's uh, almost like too coincidental and too close in time to be totally coincidental. Um, so in, uh, in the summer of 87, so Germany was really annoyed with what's happening in some more because Germany is the one that has the most interest of all Western powers to take over some more. And they really don't want a stable native government in some more that has an ally in, in the Northern Pacific. So they, they sent their own warships and then threatened war against Hawaii because of some more. So this is a picture actually that John, John took in some more. You have the Kakami Law, the Hawaiian warship, and in the back is the Adler, the German warship, and it's hard to see on this picture, but the Adler has about uh, 20 times the firepower of the Kakami Law, plus she is ironclad, so even if the Kakami Law fires back, it's not going to damage the Adler too much, so you, you already see who, like, who wins this naval battle, if, if it had happened. So yeah, so Germans can really push, push this really, really strongly, and then in August they actually do invade and occupy Samoa. They kidnap Maria Toa, take him all the way to Germany, and then they take him to one of the German colonies in Africa. And, I mean, the poor guy is just super lucky that he survived all that. And ten years later, they did come back to Samoa. But definitely, like, again, they're still coming in, again, they're still coming in. It's Western gunboat diplomacy to really kind of mess things up there. Um, and then at the same time, you know, of course, all of you who know about Hawaiian history, you know what happened in the summer of 87 in Honolulu, and that is that the, the missionary party, the, the descendants of, of American missionaries, uh, led by people like Thurston, Dole, W. O. Smith, um, Whitley, Serena Bishop, and there's a whole bunch of them, all the names, all these infamous names are, are pretty known. Um, and together with their, with their militia, the Honolulu Rifles, they take over, they launch a coup, coup d'etat against the Hawaiian government. They um, almost 
kill and the, and the they actually plan to lynch ships and put them on like uh, hanging from one of the one of the ships in the harbor, but he has uh, some way of escaping that fortunately. And they also threatened to kill to kill him because they ran into the palace with banners in their hands, that's why the name obviously of the constitution, but they forced him to sign a bad constitution and then essentially they are taking over. Um, and this new cabinet is, 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 is bad and really they are just like just like um, Bishop before under when he was minister under Nalino, they are very hostile to this whole notion of, of pan Pacific unity. All their concern is how Hawaii can become closer to the US to be eventually uh, taken over by the US. So they close all this down, like they recall Bush from Samoa, they recall the, the Kadi they close down all these Hawaiian consulates and embassies, I mean, most of them. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So that, uh, at, this, at this point, the, uh, someone at uh, the Hawaiian uh, pan Oceania policy, at least officially, becomes terminated. However, now there's another interesting thing, and that's why it's worth to go to archives all over the world. Um, there's a very interesting anecdote here that I found just pretty much a pure coincidence because the King Kalakaua's papers are only, they are fragmentary, there's only, there's, King Kalakaua's papers are not completely in the archives. There, is, there are gaps because they are, they are, they are the, the bayonet people and then later the overthrow people, they deliberately destroyed a lot of King Kalakaua's papers. So there's like big gaps in the record. And so, um, because uh, I was in the French archives doing a few research on Tahiti, I found this like, absolutely interesting thing here. So it looks like in, in late 1887, King Kalakaua finally planned to do actually a trip to Oceania, which makes sense, right? When you he already had been to Asia, to the Middle East, to Europe, to, to the Americas. Um, but Oceania, which was his big, I mean, that was his passion to, to unify all Polynesia. Uh, he never actually went there physically, right? So it would make sense that he would soon over there do a trip there. And apparently in 1887, even though he had just lost most of his powers due to the bayonet, he wanted to undertake his trip. And the reason I know this is because King Kumada V, who at that time was under a French protectorate, so he was no longer a fully sovereign chief, a uh, fully sovereign king, but he was still, he was still there to some extent. I mean, in a way, he was almost in a similar position to Kamakawa to Kama at the time, in a way. And um, he, um, so there's his letter. Omar V writes a letter to the French Ministry of French, French um, Ministry of the Colonies. He writes a letter and says, hey, um, you know, I'm going to host King Kamakawa pretty soon here. And I, I, I expect to be awarded one of these royal orders from Hawaii. And I mean, I, I would just totally lose space, lose Faces that don't have anything to reciprocate. So he, he attaches this sketch here of the um, a planned royal order of Pomare. And because at that time he is under a French overrule, he cannot really make sovereign decisions to create such an order. Right? So he asked the French government, would you, would you allow me to create this, this royal order of Pomare so I would have something to give Kawa in return if he gives me one of these Hawaiian royal orders? And so, while well, the French government you know, arrogant colonialists as they are, they're denying that and say, no, you're now under France, you don't get to get a world order. Um, and then also the trip of this is every day to say for whichever reason Salah Kawa is not implementing his plan to, to travel to Tahiti and possibly to other Oceanian islands. But there's definitely, so there's this, the point I'm making is that during the after bed, after bed, King Salah Kawa is still trying to do as much as he could both domestically, he tried to do as much as he could to bring to give to, 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 get, to get the rights back for him and his people that had been taken. But apparently, also in foreign policy, he tried to like, continue his pan Pacific policy as much as he could, with, like trying to, you know, trying to make a trip to the even though know, then, for some other reason that I don't know, he was not able to actually do it. And so, I think um, you know, I've talked for more than an hour, so it's Getting, getting long enough now. I will just finish up with like a few, uh, like three more slides, and um, just wanted to uh, share like, some of the king's own words about his kind of vision of uh, both his kind of global vision and also his vision for the Pacific. So um, the first one is like 
interesting what he says in Japan when he is in, he gives a speech in, in Tokyo in 81, and that's like actually very interesting. But he says it is imperative for the countries of the East, which by uh, which he means both Asia and North Asia, including over there, to form a league to maintain the status quo in the East in this way opposing the European countries. The time for action has come. So as early as 1881, he, during his trip, he said, like, you've got to do something, because there's this onslaught of white supremacy and colonialism, and, you know, all of us were kind of on the downside of this, we need to, you know, we need to work together. And again, this is really like, you know, prefigures what some of the things that the uh, post-colonial leaders, if, you know, the, the third world leaders in, in, in the non-aligned movement, in, in the 1950s would say, that that's what Nehru of India said, that's what Kwan Nkrumah of Ghana, the first president of independent African country, that's it's kind of that same discourse that we have like in the 1950s in the, in the, in the decolonized countries, and you know, you have King Kalakaua saying kind of the same things 100 and 130 or so years before that. Um, and then the second quote is, um, you know, after, after that, and obviously 89, he's still king formally, but he's you know, pretty much in the dire state of, of, of power at home. And um, he, you know, he corresponds with friends, and um, already at that time, the, the propaganda machinery of the missionary party is running, right? They're trying to, they're denouncing, you got these people like Serena Bishop and W. D. Alexander, like producing this propaganda history of how bad Kalakawa was, and he was corrupt, he was drunk, he was like all this kind of stuff that did. You guys probably had that or heard at one point. And, um, and at that time already, as part of the standard, they, they, they kind of misportray this whole Pan Pacific thing as like another crazy fancy of Kalakawa. Like, so it's always been that also Kalakawa was drunk, he was corrupt, and then he had this totally crazy, nuts vision of becoming the emperor of Oceania. So there you see how, how, how stupid he was. Kind of, you know, so you get this, this kind of discourse is being produced already, like right, right off right, right the bayonet, and they start producing this kind of propaganda. And so because of that, so he responds to some of this um, in his letter to his, to his, uh, to his, uh, to his one of his friends. And says, of course, did I send? Of course, I did send Bush, the, the ambassador, to, to someone. But it was from a, from a repeated call from Samoa, as well as all the other South Sea Islands, a call of confederation or solidarity of the Polynesian race. Our mission was simply a mission of philanthropy more than anything. So again, you have the, you know, in his own words, it's very clear um, why he did it. I mean, it's a sense of, 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 of Koreana um, helping, helping his, his, his cousins in the feeling like this responsibility. Um, now before I, I, I could end it at this, because just be a historian, just remember what was in history, but I don't want to do that. I want to actually go to the present and see how this can be relevant today and how it is actually already being made relevant today. And um, so we just move forward like more than 100 years. Um, and we move to Lago Goa, 2011. 28th of, of, um, of November. Um, so we have, what you see in the picture here is actually a meeting of the Polynesian leaders group. These are like the heads of state of the independent countries of Polynesia today. And we have the Prime Minister of Samoa, Tuilaia Kawasa Ilele Maria Lingaui. That's the one at the far right, the big guy on his, his song on his cell phone. Um, and so, this is just after he had just created this, like it was his essentially his work to try to create this this, this new regional organization of Polynesian leaders coming together, the Polynesian leaders group. And he's being interviewed with the Samoan local newspaper, Samali. And again, on all possible day, on all possible days, this interview is being done on the Hawaiian Independence Day, which I'm not sure whether either Twitter Empire or the journalist is aware of that, but for whichever reason it is happening on that day which to me makes it way more symbolic than anything else. And he says, it's not a new group, a new idea. The idea of the Polynesian Confederation dates back to the 1880s, over 100 years ago. It was the height of imperialism in the Pacific, and King Kamehameha, he gets the wrong, he meets Kamehameha, was obviously in the 1880s, you don't have any of the Kamehamehas, so slightly misinformed, but, you know, not important here. Uh, of Hawaii, King Pumar of Tahiti, 
Maria Tuolo Pepe of Samoa, and King George Tupo of Tonga agreed to set up the Confederation of Polynesian States at the time. Envoys from Hawaii were received here in Apia, the capital of Samoa, and agreements were signed. So I mean, this is like really interesting. So you have like a, a, a modern, modern day Polynesian leader from another island in Samoa who is totally aware of this and actually sees this as a model for how Polynesian leaders today can can come together and actually do something, like actually implement what Kalakaua dreamed of more than 100 years ago. Um, the last little sentence is also interesting. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. You probably all know Kamala Mokono Fred and what he did and how he did this very encouraging act in 2014 when he sent his letter to the Secretary of State. And I mean, there was a, a lot of debate about that. Um, but I think what's much less known is that in 2014, um, Kamala Mokono of Oha also um, joined the Manitoba Polynesian Leaders Group as an observer to represent Hawaii. So we already have kind of Hawaii already has now. Again, I'm not saying that it's legitimate. I'm not saying that Oha is necessarily legitimate. We can we can argue forever whether it's legitimate anything or not or whatever, but or whether it represents the kingdom or it shouldn't or whatever. But nonetheless, I mean, the point is that Hawaii already has a foot in this door in the way that the Samoan and these other leaders are ready to receive somebody from Hawaii to represent them as well. So in a way it's like it's coming back, it's coming full circle. And you know where it's where it's gonna be, I don't know. I'm not sure whether Kamala Bono or any other Hawaiian representative was there in the last meeting this past August, because I haven't been followed up with the PLG. But nonetheless I think this is just like some interesting um, facts of, of recent of recent specific history that that to me makes Salakawa's um, project of the 1880s really relevant again today. So on that note, I definitely have uh, talked too much and uh, mahalo to all of you for coming and that's it.
I, my understanding is that it means the center is like a beacon, it's like a beacon of hope for the Pacific, and these other stars are like the other archipelagos who go through to kind of this, this kind of this radiating, and if this is the kind of mana of a body radiating out towards the other islands. That's, I think, my understanding of what that means. But the very specifics of some of these, um, I am somewhat suspicious that I had to, because I haven't really studied how to know why in detail, because how to know why to this kind of symbolism and kind of, kind of cryptic symbols that were, that were not necessarily ancient Hawaiian, but also were part of their work, but probably they were also from Freemasonry influence. So I, if you study how to know uh, symbolism in detail, you might get some more clues of what these single elements mean in that, in that novel, but that's all I can say for now, but I haven't studied that again. Yeah, sure. So that's very interesting, yeah. Um, that's what I'm doing. Um, it's, the, it's the imperial standard. It is the, actually, no, the naval standard. They created a separate, a specific Hawaiian naval standard. Um, that's, not, that's not the um, head of state flag. No, 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 it's a different one. It's a looks specific. Like it kind of looks like it. Like it, it, like it, 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 it so it has, as you can see, it has the, it has the Union Jack. And it also has uh, a uh, coat of arms, so it's kind of, it looks like it's a combination of the national flag and the world standard, but it actually isn't. If you look at it in more detail, there's actually, there's actually a crest. It's, what, uh, so it's it, part it, inside here. Yeah, so that is not the coat of arms. It's very quickly, from this to this side, it looks like yeah, it is. Yeah, it's hard to tell. It is not. It is actually a naval crest. It's the royal naval crest. It has two crosses, two logo, and I mean, it has. And, It's a derogation of what we had in the National Board of Arms, but it's, that, like, it's a separate symbol that was specifically uh, created for the Royal Hawaiian Navy. Well, thank you for the question, Christine. Yeah, it's a great question. Any other question? If you're too shy, you just talk to me privately afterwards. Not a problem. On the warship, is that from another country or is that from Hawaii? Um, well, that's very interesting. That's a very controversial. Uh, was a very controversial issue at the time because the, it is actually a former trading ship, and it was a British British trading ship that the Hawaiian King and Durban bought for about I think fifteen thousand no no less for five thousand euros for five thousand dollars, and then they refitted it for about twenty thousand with like a few cannons and like, just like beefed it up to some extent. But, it was not as it was not really a warship, and there was this big controversy because there was a, there was this editorial um, at that time in one of the Hawaiian newspapers that was very supportive of the general idea of Hawaiian you know, pan-Hawaiianism, but they were saying this is like you know, why are we doing this kind of junk stuff? Like you do this kind of half-assed kind of stuff. We need to we what we need to do is we need to get an ironclad for sixty thousand dollars, which was a lot of money at the time. But, there was the kind of the smallest iron, the smallest iron iron that you could buy in London was like sixty thousand dollars. And no, we, we, we really shouldn't do this. We should get a we should get an iron type warship and then like we like really play that game at the real level. So it was controversial. So some people consider the Hawaiian government to do like a bad job with getting this ship in this way. So how long did it take for you to do the research and why did you go out about it? Okay, that's a a good, uh, good question. So I, um, it goes back very, very much a long time. When I was when I was 15 years old, I was living in Germany. I just had, um, you know, like many teenage boys, I was just into like adventures and stuff like far away and, and, and somewhere the, the Pacific Island just sparked my interest. And um, and it was at the same time in 1995 when the French were doing a nuclear testing in Tahiti. And that really pissed me off, to be honest. Like, I was like, I mean, I was just saying that. I mean, I started to like these islands. And then it's just like, I mean, you know, what is happening? And then, it's, and then you know, like, uh, one of the Western governments is blowing these islands up with their stupid nuclear arms. I mean, I was like, I was, I was outraged. And that is kind of, I guess that's how the energy the energy started for me, and then I really wanted to, you know, and I wanted to study more and like know about the Pacific politics and 
And then I had up here, and I'm ready because it's your age, by the way, it's like the biggest specific studies research center in the world. And since I was in Hawaii, I always had to get interest in Hawaii more than because that was the place that I was at. So I learned Hawaii, and I learned, I, you know, took all these Hawaii studies classes, and then I, and I got to join like, you know, some really great people. One of them was um, Havani K. Dras, uh, where I took classes from. Then I, I became really close to Dr. Ricky Kuni Blaster, who mentored me. Um, and then I met uh, Dr. Ken Osai, who also has, has mentored me and uh, is really my good friend. And, and many other people, too, in, in kind of those circles, is like the widest sense of, of, of that. So, with that <laughs> very personal story, but it's hopefully. Um, I think Thank you again. Good night.